Hello YouTube, today I'm going to discuss how helmet mounted tracking works in the real world versus what we are seeing it operate as in uh, Star Citizen as of right now version 1.1.3 and this came from the fact that some people were kind of talking about you know aiming their weapons with or gimbaled weapons with track IR and I thought I'd show how it works in the real world in real world helmet mounted displays whether it's aiming the AIM-9X Sidewinder or the Python missile in the case of an F-16 or the Archer missile, the AA-11, or I believe it's the R-77 designation in, uh, under Russian vernacular for the MiG-29 or the Su-27. In all of these cases, and incidentally also in the case of the H-64, which we'll talk a little bit more in depth here in a minute, the helmet mounted tracking system and display is used primarily and only for target acquisition. Now there's a couple of edge cases where that may not necessarily be the case in when it comes to the age 64 but in all those other aircraft you're using it for merely target acquisition locking on to a target the missile guidance system or a targeting computer takes over the rest of the calculations and tasks from that point forward interestingly enough in the age 64 it is still primarily only used by the gunner in order to maintain a, a target acquisition lock once that lock is achieved, the gunner usually goes back to looking at other things in the cockpit, and the targeting computer on board the helicopter takes care of the rest, whether it's firing Hellfire Precision Munitions or the 30mm chain gun mounted to its nose. Now, it can the 30mm gun can be overridden, and the pilot can, or I shouldn't say the pilot, the gunner can manually aim the weapon uh, wherever he's looking at and particularly this is beneficial if it's a fairly close engagement under like 500 yards or something like that uh, can that be useful but as you go out longer ranges and they need more precision they'll actually turn the head tracking off and go to using um, basically a mini stick or an analog joystick uh, in the cockpit in order to fine tune and precisely aim at a target at a distance so interestingly enough for long distance precision aiming they're not using head tracking for that particular task, just merely to get the FLIR uh, camera or the LASIK data designator in a particular area and getting it fairly close. And in the case of most vehicles and things like that, close is good enough for the system to then pick out the target. In the case of infantry, actually still then the targeting computer is pretty good enough about distinguishing those heat sources and things like that and then locking on to specific targets. But again, used primarily for target acquisition, not actual targeting and looking where you shoot. I'm not precisely sure how that works on the Mi-24, but I would doubt that it would be any different. The uh, Soviet Russian uh, Hind helicopters or the Mi-28 Havocs, which is the more modern replacement for it. Uh, if anybody out there knows, be sure to correct me or tell me in the section below. I'm sure there's some out there who do. Now, the other reason, or the other thing to point out here is, even in the Apache, fine-tuned control over aiming the chain gun and firing Hellfire precision-guided munitions are left to the gunner, not the pilot. That rotorcraft or helicopter has two people in control. It has a pilot and it has a gunner with separate areas of responsibility. Now, I believe that the pilot, pilot is responsible for firing off rocket pods, unguided rockets, but anything that's a precision-guided munition or requires aiming to lock on and acquire target is done so by the, gu uh, by the gunner, and that would be Hellfire missiles or the chain gun. That's all under the purview of the gunner. Now, that's not to say that the pilot doesn't have an override mode, and should something happen and the gunner be incapacitated or otherwise killed during action, I believe that the gunner or the pilot can take over the gunner's duties and basically slave the gun to his helmet mounted display and things like that. So, in an emergency type situation, yes, the pilot can be the one aiming the gun and stuff like that, but that's not kind of par for the course as it comes to standard operating procedures and those weapon systems go. Now, another interesting fact is why these duties are separated into two separate individuals. And this gets to be known as a phenomenon or a phenomenon known, especially in modern jet fighters, as information overload. It's literally gotten to the point where in a lot of cases, there's too much information there for a pilot to focus in on. That's a lot of reasons why aircraft started going to a two-seater configuration. 
whether it was back in the F-4 where you had a pilot and then a radar intercept officer, same with the F-14, or whether it would be the F-15E Strike Eagle, in which has um, a lot of the bombing calculations and stuff like that, is responsible of the rear seater. Again, I think they're still called RIOs, radar intercept officers, but they're also responsible for making sure JDAMs are programmed essentially correct. And that's because you start getting a, a pilot doing an individual pilot doing too many things at one time, and it becomes sensory overload, and actually parts of the brain just start shutting down. And that can have very deadly consequences to a pilot. Let's take the AH-64, especially when you're navigating that close to the ground and you have hazards, trees, buildings, terrain, uh, other things like uh, power lines, things of that nature, things that the pilots need to be paying attention to. And if you're asking a pilot to both do precision gunning and trying to keep maintain situational awareness, what's going to happen is when you're focused on shooting a target, especially precise aiming at a target, a lot of your mental energy is going to go into that, and as a result, it creates, I forget the name of this effect, but essentially you get tunnel vision, where it's like looking through a paper tube. Uh, this phenomenon happens in just about every lethal force encounter. Uh, Grossman, Colonel Grossman, uh, has written about this extensively in On Killing and uh, his other book that, oh, I can't remember the name of it. But at any rate, he covers this relatively extensive after a, studies of lethal force encounters. And dogfighting and or piloting a helicopter in a combat situation, you know, you may not be looking down the gun of, or the uh, sights of a gun, of a rifle, but at the same time, it is still a lethal force encounter. The adrenaline's still going, and as a result, you know, you get that kind of tunnel vision effect. Well, that's fine and good and all if you're a gunner and you don't have to worry about avoiding a building that's 50 meters in front of you. If you're a pilot and focused, you got that tunnel vision, by the time you're basically come out of it and your peripheral vision picks up that there's a threat that you're about to fly into a building, it could very well be too late. So that's another reason why they separate the duties of aiming and firing versus flying when it comes to either aircraft like the F-14, the F-15E Strike Eagle, uh, or the AH-64, or the Mi-24 Hind. So I thought I'd put that tidbit out there. Be sure to like, subscribe, share. See you next time.